Deep in the darkest reaches of the world's oceans, anglerfish are staples of deep sea environments. And when people think of deep sea fish, these animals are among the first to come to mind. Of course, the variety among them is huge, and there are many different species, so choosing ones to feature in this video for the year was a difficult endeavour. What I settled on at the end of the day though, after a good long browse, were two animals that I wasn't at all familiar with, being the wolf trap and the trap jaw anglerfish. These two genera of anglerfish, being Lazy Gnathus and Thaumatichthys respectively, are some of the most unique fish in the ocean, and frankly are hugely under-discussed and underrated because of that, with them both having some of the most interesting and dynamic life appearances and behaviours around in any fish. Getting into things, the taxonomy is a story and a half, with both being considered to be together in the family of Thaumatichthyidae due to the shared morphological characters, like the huge hinged promaxillaries, the denticles on the mouths, the largely inwardly hooked teeth, as well as their branched operculum. Differences over time were however noted, notably that the trap jaw anglerfish have lower jaw projections which extend further and well beyond their upper jaw, as well as the upper part of their operculum not being bifurcated. When it comes to the total species that are present among them all, there are three in Thaumatichthys and six in Lazygnathus, meaning that their diversity is quite high, and it's something nice to see among deep sea animals, of which most of this information is scarce at best. For some background on Thaumatichthys, the genus name means wonderfish, with Thauma meaning wonder or marvel, and Dichthys of course being Greek for fish. This name alludes to the unusual head shape of their heads, which is also just as large as the rest of their bodies, and also help in their feeding adaptations, which I'll talk about shortly. Differences over time were however noses, noticeably that the trap jaw anglerfish lower jaws project further and well beyond their upper jaw, as well as the upper part of their apiculum not being bifurcated. Of the three species, there are T. axolai, T. binghami, and T. pagigostomus. T. pagigostomus is the type species, being described in 1912, and are found across the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, at depths of around 1,400 metres down, with them having relatively longer promaxillaries than the other species, with their anterior teeth also being a good deal longer. T. binghami, described in 1927, has a long middle whisker, the fleshy lure that anglerfish use to entice prey, that is finger-like in its appearance with the other two also being quite longer in comparison to the other two species. And finally, T. axillae is a species that shares T. binghami's trait of having relatively short promaxillaries, though they differ in that the esker of this species has a single pair of lateral lobes that are enlarged into large tapering filaments, with the uppermost appendage being wart-like and not tapering off like how the others do. They also live at depths greater than any other member of the genus, being found as far down as 3.6 kilometers in the abyssal zone. They are also known to be the biggest of the genus, and also of these kinds of anglerfish in general, with the largest known individual being found to be around 50 centimetres long. Their common name is the Prince Axel's Wonderfish, and on their discovery, were thought to be an entirely new genus, being given the name of Galathuthorma axoli, with the genus name being named after the ship which found them, the Galathia, and the species and common name being a clear reference to their at the time at Prince Axel of Denmark. The people who described this fish were aware of T. pagistomus, they didn't consider this newly found fish to be in the same genus since T. bagistomus was a much smaller animal and only around 8cm long. This was however a premature decision as it would turn out, as additional specimens indicated that this size difference was merely attributable to age, and so the two genera were lumped together, with Thaumatichthys taking priority as it was the oldest name of the two. When it comes to their habitats, they range across tropical oceans worldwide, though specifics are often hard to come by. T. pagindostoma the first species to be described, for instance, is only known from one specimen which was caught at a depth of 1.4 kilometers down in the Gulf of Tamaini, off of Sulawesi. T. axolai occurs broadly in the Pacific Ocean generally, and T. binghami is found around the Caribbean Sea. Something unique compared to other deep sea anglerfish is that these fish are generally benthic, living close to the seabed at depths as low as they can go, with T. pagidostomus and T. binghami being found on continental shelves between 1,000 to 2,000 meters deep while T. axolai is found all the way down at depths of 3.6 kilometers, as I've mentioned earlier in the video. This of course means that picking up specimens from nets is an incredibly rare occurrence, and when they are picked up, it's more often through the devastating practice of bottom trawling. Before discussing their anatomy, I'll be next talking about the other genus in the Thaumatichthidae family, being Lazy Gnathus, which is a more species-rich genus with six species that are known from the Pacific and the Atlantic. Lazy Gnathus is a name derived from the ancient Greek word of Lasios, meaning hairy, and Nathos meaning jaw, which does track given their appearance of looking like they have rather hairy beards. When it comes to our knowledge of them, all of the specimens we have come from metamorphosed females, so our knowledge of them in their entirety is lacking. 
What this shows though is that, just like other anglefish, there is evidently the typical extreme sexual dimorphism taking place, where the males are much smaller, and when they mate, where the male is subsumed into the female for reproductive purposes. Species-wise, the six that are known are found around a wide variety of scattered localities in the Atlantic and Pacific, and each have their own little quirks that make them all special. The first describes was L. Sacostoma in 1925, then being named by English ichthyologist Charles Tate Reagan from a specimen found in the Caribbean Sea, with this individual being found 98 kilometers northwest of Negril, Jamaica, collected from a depth of 2,000 meters. Their specific name of Sacostoma combines the word sacos, which means bag, pocket, or pouch, with stoma meaning mouth, which is a reference to a large membrane that insists in food capture, which then connects to their large premaxillaries. They also have three large escal hooks on their heads, with there being a further distinguishing trait in their case of being darkly pigmented, and are also the smaller species in their genus, with the largest adults only being a tiny 7.7 centimeters long. The second to be described species, L. Beebei, is named after American naturalist William Beebe, who is an instrumental founder of the field of ecology as well as one of the foremost advocates of conservation in the 20th century. He really deserves a whole video of his exploits, but one other thing that he is also remembered well for was the several hypotheses he had on avian evolution, which was well ahead of his time, namely his 1915 hypothesis of the Tetrapteryx stage, where he proposed that bird evolution went through a transitory stage, where their ancestors possessed four wings and were gliding animals, something we now see in the known fossils of Microraptorians. While we now know that such forms were not a transitory stage, as we now have a much more complete picture of avian evolution, this artistic depiction by Bibi is seriously quite astounding. In any case, I've rambled long enough about this dude, I can certainly save all that for a future video, so it's about time to get back on topic to talk about our good spooky friends, particularly the one which is named after him. The holotype of El Bibi was recovered near Nonsuch Island by Bermuda from a depth between 0 and 1100 meters, really narrowing it down there guys, by Charles Reagan yet again, as well as Ethelwyn Trerevas, another ichthyologist who worked at the British Museum. Along with being found here, they've also been found to have a decently wide range across the North Atlantic, also being found off of Oahu in Hawaii. The third to be described species was El Waltoni in 1972, with them being characterised by the possession of a membranous crest on their escal bulb, alongside an extended cylindrical escal appendage at their tip. They are known from the Central Pacific, namely around the island of Oahu, where so far the only the holotype specimen has ever been recovered. Their specific name honours Sir Isaac Walton, who was the author of The Complete Angler, a book which was published in 1653 and is a celebration of the art and spirit of fishing. The fourth species is L. Intermedius, described in 1996, with the name being an allusion to the morphology of the Resca, being in an intermediate form between that of L. Bibii, L. Sacostoma, and L. Waltoni. They are found across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, being found from Newfoundland to South Carolina and Bermuda, as well as being found all the way down in South Africa. Continuing on, L. Ampharamphus was described in 2005 and is characterised by only having two as compared to three bony hooks on the resca, along with a long prolongation at the end of the main appendage which has six small filaments at the end. L. Ampharamphus is also the largest known species of the genus, with the largest specimen being about 15.7 cm in length, which is quite respectable. And then for the sixth and final species, L. dynema was described as just 10 years ago in 2015, with them being unique in having an internally pigmented escal appendage that is paired alongside two elongases, distal appendages. With all of the different species covers, it's now time to talk about what makes these fish truly unique, and that is their extremely interesting mouth anatomy. These fish have huge premaxillaries, where the upper jaw is big enough to extend well beyond the much shorter lower jaw. They have a wide membrane which connects them to the heads, and this is what helps them in holding their prey once caught. Both promaxillaries are hinged with the upper jaw so that they're able to flip down and up, and the sheer size of them means that prey can be captured without the lower jaw, which in turn frees them up to continue respiring while they restrain their food. Over time, their lure apparatus has also gone through some revisions in terms of what it might be used for, with William Beebe speculating in 1930 that said apparatus might be, quote, be cast swiftly ahead when then the hooks and the lights would so frighten any pursued fish that they would hesitate long enough to be engulfed in the onrushing moor." End quote. Though other researchers have since considered this unlikely. In all likelihood, like many other anglerfish, these animals likely use their glowing lure to draw prey in that becomes attracted by the light, with them then employing their unique jaws to grab them. 
What they feed on specifically is also known from some of the gut contents, with bony fish like lanternfish and bristlemouse making up most of their diet, with them also taking amphipods, siphonophores, and ketognaths to a lesser degree. One specimen of T. binghamai interestingly shows that sea cucumbers are also on the menu, with there also being a piece of sargassum, a type of seaweed present as well. This could well suggest that they're omnivorous, but what is more likely is that they may well have incidentally swallowed this grass along with the sea cucumber that they ate, so it's more than likely accidental. Given these sea cucumbers are also very tiny, only being about 50 to 80 millimeters long, that is the explanation I'd go with. Whether or not these fish are parasitic is also unknown, though the structure of the jaws in male fish seems to indicate that feeding becomes in pairs after the metamorphosis. So to conclude, there is still much we don't yet know on these animals, but given that they are so unknown, that also means there is still so much more we can learn about them. And that to me is one of the most fun and exciting things about zoology. There's always more to learn. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.